Well, hi everyone, and welcome to today's final Sifted Talks of the Year in partnership with Slack. As we approach the end of the year, we thought it'd be a good time to discuss how founders, executives, and investors can implement strategies in the new year to allow them to work smarter, reduce stress, and enhance their well-being. As some of you in the audience know or have experienced personally, being an entrepreneur is inherently a pretty stressful job, um, and people deal with it in very different ways, um, as we'll find out from our panel today. So joining me today is Dimple Patel, CEO of Nature Metric, Johan Brand, founder of Kahoot and We Are Human, Soanga Chandra Talaka, general partner at Builderton VC, and Vanessa O'Mahony, head of small and growth businesses in EMEA Slack. Great, so just a little bit of housekeeping before we begin. Um, there'll be no standalone Q&A section at the end of the talk, so we'll be taking questions throughout, so please do submit those um, via the Q&A function below. Cool. So, Johan, just as you're taking a, a slug of tea there, I want to start with you. Um, you said in our pre-panel call that you only really figured out what work-life balance really means after founding your first company. Um, so could you please start us off by speaking a little bit more about that um, and explain how, you know, you were perhaps ignoring your own well-being and how that affected you? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I remember um, starting Kahoot, looking at my friends and, figure, and asking, how can they have kids and, and jobs? Um, uh, I mean, the way I was not good at time boxing my time, I didn't really separate between, you know, when you're on and off. Uh, I felt like uh, being in a global company from day one, you know, you're always available, um, not setting the boundaries. And also because of my, um, my, the way my brain is as a neurodivergent person, I even more need that type of uh, framing around me. And I did not talk about that for people around me. So maybe my biggest mistake was not being transparent to the people around me, how I actually needed them to <laughs> help me manage my time and my energy uh, and i took every challenge as the biggest challenge in the world uh so prioritizing my challenges as well was um was not a good thing which i've of course seen in hindsight taking the time to assess what's coming in instead of just acting upon it as, a, as the biggest crisis i think you feel very responsible as ceo and founder early on before you haven't really had but you know i hadn't really hadn't done that before so yeah so later on now i've been I've been much, I've realized that being good with structure is actually something to, it's a benefit for people around you. You're a better version of yourselves when you turn up in the meetings. I'm not bringing my frustration and bad energy. Um, so, you know, I think this thing is as much about how it affects others, which you then get paid back to you. You know, if you smile to the world, it smiles back. It's the same with um, management skills. You talked a lot about kind of um, embedding boundaries right into into your work as a founder how do you how do you do that yourself now and what advice would you give to other people to actually do that yeah I mean I'm, I'm being quite clear on when people can call me you know uh, what what medium is okay for this type of uh, asynchronous live um, which I think is as much about the times is actually the form of communication communication and then trying to divvy up, you know, sometimes, you know, you're dealing with the US. Okay, so after this time and evening, I have a slot. If it's outside of that, I'm sorry, but I'm not available. So, uh, but then choose this type of communication. I'll pick it up while you're sleeping. So being very kind of transparent about also how I'll act on information that comes in. Uh, and I've been trying to get an assistant for the last 10 years. But my problem is the assistant needs to be able to work with me. <laughs> So instead, I've been trying to divide out with different people around me as well. But now with, you know, uh, the hype word of AI, it is helping, actually. Uh, it is helping me. Dimple, you've held several executive positions at fast growing companies. Um, how do you kind of create boundaries in your job as CEO? Or how else do you kind of cope with the various strains you have without just totally burning out? That's a good question. And I, I can totally resonate with uh, with what Johan shared. As a founder, when I started my first business, I went in uh, a million miles an hour um, tackling every single issue or challenge that possibly came up and worked as many hours a day that I could. Um, and at that point, that literally was my entire life. It was all I did when I wasn't sleeping. That's 
you know, building a company. Um, I did eventually end up burning myself out and um, then went on to have a family, have children, um, actually go through like having children and the limitations that puts on your body. And it just, it forces you to self-regulate one emotionally, but be really understand the the impact that stress is having on your body as well um but then the responsibilities that you get on the other side you know your, your business is not the center of your life anymore and I think you know it's definitely been a work in progress there's still moments where I prioritize everything else except myself um and then end up having to kind of do a little bit of a reset and, and put some additional boundaries in place I think practical things that help me so my calendar I you know, I'm really, you know, fairly disciplined in terms of blocking out time in my calendar. If there's, you know, one day a week when I'm picking the kids up from school, that is blocked out, it's not accessible to anybody. If there's another day when I want to have dinner with the family, again, that is also blocked out. Um, and I use that signposting in my calendar as much as I can, because when people do want to talk to me, it might be a case of, well, I'm going to be driving, I can take a voice call but I'm not going to be delivering a presentation because my video is not going to be on. So I think just being really clear about that, being open with the people around you as well. So your exec teams who, to be honest, a lot of the time are probably facing similar challenges themselves, but don't want to ask the question in case they come across as less dedicated or slightly distracted. So it's just creating the space to be like, well, we're all going to do our best work, but actually what does that look like structurally? Um, communicating that with your assistant as well. Um, so they have effectively the operating rules within how, within which to kind of, you know, allocate your time. Um, but then there are moments when you go through the day and realize you haven't eaten since like 6 a.m. and it's about five o'clock in the afternoon and you're running out of energy. So um, I think as many of those markers and reminders as you can, setting alarms on your phone at say one o'clock, and that goes off and there's a the trigger there of like, I just need to extract myself from what I'm doing and go get some food quickly. Um, but building a business can, you know, there's a certain level of obsession behind it. And you do need to regulate how far you disappear down that rabbit hole. Um, so yeah, and just kind of taking ideas from everyone else and testing it and seeing how that lands with people around you, how it affects your productivity and then, you know, iterating on that. Also, bottom line, make sure you eat, people. Yes, yes. <laughs> Bad things happen if you do not. <laughs> My boyfriend's like, you're really angry. And I'm like, have you eaten today? <laughs> Usually that's the reason why. Um, so, Anga, you work as a VC these days, but you also led a company for over 10 years um, in San Francisco. Yeah. What did you learn from that experience of the benefits of supporting your mental health? Um, and also maybe to add to that, how easy is it to actually prioritize your mental health when you're at the helm of a really fast growing company? Yeah, I, so I think it's really hard to prioritize um, your mental and physical health uh, when you're when you're running a fast growing company. Um, you know, just to sort of echo what Dimple said, I think it's it's a journey of of passion right and and you 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 do it because you really believe in it and you really want it to be a success and the deeper you go in the more there is to kind of lose i mean you know you, there are more and more employees and customers and partners who depend on you and investors um and then there's also just this sense of well i've spent x years of my life doing it like i better have something to show for it at the end um and um you know, as irrational as some of that is, I mean, all these people that I've just mentioned are also adults and, you know, they can get other jobs and investors lose money sometimes. And, you know, like, despite all of that, I think it's very normal for a founder to take on a lot of that responsibility, um, especially as a first time founder. Um, I think it, it people tend to get a bit healthy about it over time um, and maybe with, with the sort of second or third companies. Um and and because of all of that, you just get into this state where you there's always something slightly wrong or something that could be done a bit more or done a bit better. And because you have this level of responsibility on your shoulders, you put there yourself more than anything else. Um, you say to yourself, well, the next five minutes, I could go and get that sandwich or I could just do that thing that isn't quite done yet. And guess what? You keep doing the thing that isn't quite done yet. And that never ends. So, you know, at some point you just put all of your time and all of your energy into it. Um, the biggest problem with that, I think, um, is actually a longevity because because actually building a company 
is not, you know, I mean, there, there are a few exceptions, but it's not a two or three year project. It's usually a 10 year project. You know, great companies take decades to build, not years. And if you do what I'm describing and really just not don't stop yourself and you don't look after yourself um, and the people around you and the things that matter around you, then then you won't be able to do it for the for the long, length of time that, that is actually required. And, and the, you know, founder burnout is a real problem. And we only really think about and know about the ones where that's happened spectacularly and someone's really collapsed and kind of left or whatever. But there are other ways that that happens too. People just, you know, shift to a much, much lower gear or they just struggle to get stuff done or, you know, things just start to kind of go wrong. And these are all, you know, classic outcomes of just taking too much out of yourself every day. So, um, you know, I, I guess the reason I sort of bring that up is because I think for a lot of founders, it's really hard to break away from the, no, I'm just going to do more. I'm just going to try harder because that's the kind of person you are. Um, so what I'm trying to say is, well, if you really want to do more and if you really want to succeed for all those people that you think you need to succeed for, including yourself, then actually you've got to be smart about it because if you just burn yourself out in the first two years, you're not actually going to succeed anyway. So, you know, better to be more balanced and last 10 or 15 years, and then you'll really be able to achieve what you want to achieve. I guess it's difficult because if you're like a really early stage company, you're probably thinking those minutes or hours I'm not spent working on my company is the minutes and hours that my competitor is going to kind of steam ahead of me. Yeah. Um, so I guess it is very hard at that stage, particularly to really let go. But how how do you let go as a founder? Do you just have to say I'm making a conscious decision to step back and not be kind of phased by everything else outside of my company? Yeah, so I mean, um, maybe I'll quickly answer that. But the, the way that um, I, I have found works for some people, so, so it's worth me saying that in the 10 years that I was a CEO, I don't think I actually practiced that well at all. Um, and I think it's one of the reasons that I was a CEO for 10 years and not maybe 20 years. Um, but the um, but you know I've reflected on it a lot, and I of course work with lots of founders now as a VC, and some of them do this really really well. And I think what the smart ones do in in different ways, but fundamentally what they do is on a fairly regular basis. So maybe between sort of two and four times a year, they go away and they sit down and they analyze where the company is at and what's going to matter over the next chunk of time. You know, year, two years or so, not not too much more than that. And based on that, they say, okay, because of that, here's where I need to spend my time. And therefore, here are some of the things I'm not going to spend my time on anymore. So, you know, you might, so if you think about a classic seed company, you know, in the first year or two, it might be all about building the product. And once you've got a product that appears to have market fit, you might say, right, actually, the next six months, it's all going to be about go to market, about selling this product. So I'm going to stop being in every single product call and just being in every single tech stand up because that bit's kind of done. I mean, there's more work to do, but I trust that other people are doing that. My job now is to focus on sales. And so it's things like that. It's just really consciously taking yourself out of the day-to-day -day and reminding yourself, right, this is the way I'm going to prioritize. And then you've got to be brutal, right? Whether it's with calendaring, whether it's with an assistant, if you have one, um, you know, but or whether it's just telling your team and just saying, look, I'm just not going to be on these calls anymore. And if you send me a product-related email, I will answer, but it could be in two weeks' time. So don't rely on me, you know? Whereas you know, turn to the right, you know, you sales team, I'm going to be on you every day, because that is the thing that matters for the next six months for me as a CEO. So it's about, yeah, taking your giving yourself the time to really strategically and tactically plan where your time needs to be. And the key thing you've got to include in that is where your time is not going to be as well, because you can't just have everything on the list. We just had a question come in. Um, I'll just read it aloud. How do you how do you use things like blocking time when others don't respect it or even be aware of it? E.g., you don't respond on Slack, so they contact others or call you or some other way of getting their immediate resolution instead of just waiting. Is it a leadership issue to model the way it should be? Good question. I can uh, I can jump in on that one. I think. Leadership plays a huge role in terms of the way that we respect other people's boundaries across the business. I think, you know, when you look at founders and CEOs and to be honest, the entire exec team, they have to model the behaviors that you expect to see across the entire business. Um, so I do think that, you know, if you are going to be an organization that, um, you know, wants to support your employees' work-life balance, if you want to be attractive to people that are parents, but have, you know, 10, 15 years of experience, you need to be very clear, like 
really crystal clear and very specific about what that looks like. It can't be some sweeping broad statement of, you know, we're parent friendly, do what you need to do. Um, because you need to create a safe space for people to enforce their boundaries and for them to feel safe enough not to answer that call if they have the time blocked out, to not feel guilty because they didn't respond within 20 minutes to a question that they received from somebody very senior in the organization. So I think definitely those kind of behaviors come from the top. I think in terms of some practical things that you're able to do if people are just overstepping slightly is definitely address it with your manager be really clear in terms of you know anybody that kind of gets caught in that web what are the expectations around that block time I might not respond then if, if the building is on fire please call me if the building is not on fire please just wait an hour and I will absolutely come back to you on slack but it takes a lot of repetition and I think you know when I've first joined True, I was one of the only parents on the team. And when I left, we had loads. And I, you can see the way of working shifted, but at the beginning, it felt like whack-a-mole. You know, every time it popped up, pushing it back down again. Um, and that isn't a reflection on how good you are then able to, how well you're able to do the job on the other side. It is just helping people probably for the better recognize that not everything within a startup when you're building a business is a pressing concern and extremely urgent in that moment. Vanessa, um, you've been working in tech companies for over 20 years, and I'm sure you've worked with your fair share of founders and executives. What would you say are kind of mistakes that um, founders and execs make when it comes to their well-being? Um, so, for example, would you say that they often miss the benefits of actually having um, that work-life balance? Yeah, well, um, so I lead a team that covers all of the SMB space across EMEA. So we work daily with organizations, with founders, with leaders who are looking to crack the conundrum of, you know, ensuring that their business has productive employees while also making sure that, um, you know, their well-being, their engagement is high and that they're looking after themselves. So I think a lot of what the panel has shared here today is um, really showing the insights and the retrospection of their own lived experience. What we find really is that um, the culture for founders and leaders in fast growing um, organizations it sets the tone, right? So, and it, that protects the overall business. So I suppose, you know, it's part of a bigger productivity conversation. If we we ask ourselves why founders or leaders, um, you know, are working through burnout hours to achieve goals, then it suggests that perhaps operationally there are gaps and that we should really explore how to do the productivity piece in a more meaningful way that brings everybody on a journey. So a lot of the discussions that we would have would be centered around creating a culture where, you know, there are obviously guidelines around, you know, what meetings are, are necessary, but from a productivity perspective, what we hear a lot from either our research or working with organizations is that we're still creating a dangerous scenario where um, it seems more acceptable to work out of hours um, and, and people who are, you know, working longer hours than say their nine to five or their, what their time zone warrants um, are actually demonstrating and reporting a 20% lower productivity. So it feels like we're in this cycle of mm -hmm. Almost an old world where, you know, investing in hours, doing longer hours, showing up and presenteeism suggests productivity, but actually making our people successful takes a much more holistic and more challenging way to really explore how we can get the work done, but equally, um, you know, hold ourselves accountable for making sure that we're respectful of our, of our people's boundaries. Um, I've been four years at Slack and um, I joined just before the pandemic um, and the mantra in the office was work smart and go home. And I remember landing with somewhat of a cynical eye and um, wondering, is this really true? Um, only to discover that it absolutely was. So obviously Stuart Butterfield is a particularly inspirational founder also who really walked that walk for us and, you know, was very vocal about empowering people in the organization to be respectful, um, to, you know, put your do not disturb status on Slack or more recently, you know, look for schedule send to make sure that we're not interrupting people's downtime but that it really was a cultural piece. So for me, I think the broader picture is to look at how to, you know, achieve your goals um, while at the same time being respectful of, respectful of your people and indeed leading from the front and, you know, taking care of yourself um, is part of the role of founders today. 
we've started to talk a lot more in the kind of tech industry about burnout, which is quite a welcome development. Um, but I think there are varying degrees of burnout and it means different things to different people. Um, what would you say are the signs, Vanessa, that someone is actually burning out? And have you had that experience personally? Yeah, so, um, I, you know, I think for any leader, you know, you, you need to know the warning signs of your people. You know, we know how people are showing up, um, investing and connecting with our people on a human level will hopefully create an environment where people feel um, empowered to share where they're getting overwhelmed. So, you know, there's a lot of the stats around, um, you know, what good looks like in terms of the number of meetings about how to remove, sorry, the burn of email and really look at um, how we work for, for productivity. For myself, um, I actually had a fairly dramatic um, process about, I'm gonna say about 12 years ago. So I was feeling particularly overwhelmed. Um, Dimple, you referred to it earlier around um, having children. I had two at the time, I have four now. So um, this is a super relevant conversation for me personally as well. But um, it got to the stage where I, I really considered that I, I couldn't work full time in the role that I was in because the overwhelm was, I was showing up to work, not feeling um, like I was delivering as I should be. And similarly at home, it was bleeding into my, my downtime. So I actually considered a complete change of career and went and did a degree in psychotherapy. I'm not suggesting everybody should do a degree in psychotherapy when they're feeling overwhelmed. But what that really did for me was, um, apart from being a significant investment in my own psyche and understanding, you know, my own drivers, it was the ability to empower me personally to understand what my triggers were and then to really show up for myself and advocate on my own behalf where work, um, you know, was creating uh, scenarios that, that were, were, were not helpful for me. Um, what that also gave me then was the ability to go back into that same role, actually, um, but do it by offering that vulnerability to my team and creating what we referred to earlier as that trust to um, facilitate more open conversations about how we work. And, you know, I mean, the, the conversation has moved significantly from sort of, you know, flexible hours in terms of the overall work-life balance. We now have obviously a lot of technology at Slack. We do a lot of research um, around how to facilitate the success of people such that we avoid the burnout. But what we're hearing from the research is that, you know, it's still showing up. There is a super amount of talent in the startup ecosystem across EMEA. But, you know, finding a way to really um, create a world where they are empowered to trust their own um, judgment on what good looks like is, is still tricky. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a big conversation. If I can look at my team, for example, um, most of the team is based in Dublin. Some of them are dispersed across um, Europe, but we cover all of EMEA. So mostly we're in the hub um, as a base, but people are traveling, they're in front of customers, et cetera. So we really needed to find a hybrid model that works for us and, you know, make sure that connecting as a team was core to that, but also ensuring that we continue to be product productive in a new age. So, um, you know, the baseline for that is some, some discipline and guidelines about how we show up. So really challenging ourselves around the number of meetings. So for example, we, we show up face-to-face -face for, for learning, for best practice sharing, for collaboration, but we don't show up to meet just for the sake of meeting, right? So empowering the team to create team level agreements about what good looks like, I think gives everybody input such that the connection is then high when, when you're there. The other things we, we do at Slack, um, which kind of create that culture of trust, not necessarily just about the product, is um, we have what's called a maker week. So once a quarter, all meetings are cancelled um, and it, it serves to free up calendars for deep work. But more importantly, it reminds us all to really question stuff that is sort of recurring and is in there. And that has been a really, really big ticket item for us in, in terms of, um, you know, getting rid of those sort of bi-weekly syncs, et cetera. Um, Freedom Fridays is another one we do. So, you know, or sorry, Focus Fridays. So, you know, before somebody would schedule a meeting, obviously we work with customers, you know, we, you need to have some flexibility, but that you would really consider, can I do this async? So can I jump on a huddle? Um, for those of you who are not familiar with huddles, this has been Slack's um, fast, fastest adopted um, feature this year. Um, originally set out to sort of replace those water cool cooler moments in a hybrid world. Um, they're 11 minutes long on average. So, you know, 
if you consider the overhead of scheduling a meeting and then doing a 30 minute meeting, um, it really does serve us well to kind of remove some of those um, more spontaneous, but also necessary conversations that we're, we're, we're doing. So I think the culture piece and really working as a team with your broader business to understand what good, good looks like goes a long way to um, set the team up for, for, for opening that discussion and, and uh, fill, filling your business needs while also respecting um, the well-being of your employees. Thanks for sharing that, Vanessa. Um, we've had a question come in. Um, what are some recovery tips you have when you are on the brink of burnout? Sometimes there are fires to be put out and it's just not possible to let go. Don't know if, Dimple, you want to take this or? Yeah, of course. Um, so, I mean, when I've been through burnout before, I've there have definitely been moments where I've continued to operate beyond the point at which I should have been operating. And at that point, you're just, fueled by adrenaline and you power through um so when you get beyond that you're literally at a point where you should not be operating your decision making abilities are fairly clouded um and you, you should be questioning whether you're the right person to be dealing with whatever fire needs putting out in that moment um, and potentially sometimes those fires feel slightly too overwhelming and you can't quite see your way through them i think with startups and i, I think about this also in terms of um when you're going on holiday and you're taking breaks because for years i would go on holiday but still be checking in on my phone every day, responding to emails, responding to messages, happy to take calls, because I was worried that something would fall over or there would be a fire and we wouldn't be able to put that out. Over time, I've been able to see that as a way of really stress testing the internal operations of your business. So, you know, there's moments when you extract yourself, actually as a, a CEO or a founder, to some degree, um, your goal is to delegate your yourself out of the day-to-day -day operations and I think when you have reached burnout sometimes it is better to delegate yourself out of those situations because that also creates the opportunity for other people to step up and assuming that you've hired the right talent in your organization that take initiative that have that that level of ownership people will step in and you need to trust in your in the team around you as well um in terms of recovering from burnout I mean I think that looks really different for everybody, but you do have to really prioritize yourself and your well-being. And some of that is addressing your mental load. That could be outside of work. It could be the kids' logistics and birthday party schedules or whatever it is. Um, but you know, you have to hand that over. You have to do an element of clean slate. You need to sleep, you need to rest, you need to address your diet, you need to build in some activity, whether that's just fresh air, getting out into the world, but also. Sometimes it is rebuilding connections with a support network around you that are not necessarily in your industry, because some of it is regaining a little bit of perspective, which I think sometimes when we are so in the weeds of building a business, we tend to lack um, and just, you know, getting getting those people around you just pull you out a little bit um, and just reset you. Um, and sometimes that can take weeks, sometimes it'll take months, but I think you can really see the progress. Um, quite clearly when you're on the right path. I think that um, what you just raised, Dimple, about building a supportive network, I think that's really, really important as a founder or executive. Um, does anyone else on the panel have any kind of tips for building a network of support? Um, <laughs> Johan, go ahead. Yeah, I was just listening in and thinking back uh, how it was early on in Kahoot because it was, uh, it was insane and <clears throat> none of us really had you know any experience at the level uh, <clears throat> and i actually didn't really want to be the ceo it was the first uh proper investor who said uh, well that's the job you're gonna have <laughs> as you step into it uh, uh which and i was scared of it in one way because um within creativity and innovation and neurodiverse people over index uh and uh, one of the big problems is self-regulation but it's also hyper focus right so you have like a Ferrari engine, but you don't have brakes. Uh, and the problem with that is you're very easily burnt out, but also you burn the people out around you. Um, so one of my co-founders, you know, he didn't want to share room with me because I was working when he was sleeping, go to bed and he, I was working when I was waking up. But over time, I learned a little bit about this and I started to articulate to the team as well. Like I'm not going to be CEO uh, forever. It's not my type of job. Um, it was much harder to get the board on board uh, in the beginning, um, but then you, as you, as people saying, you, you, 
you get clouded and you make worse decisions and your board see it before your employees often because when you're a founder they kind of came there because of you and and yeah so um even though i towards the end actually said i want to break uh we get a new ceo in i transition over to a different position i have to say that one of the things is my wife said we're not going to have a child if you don't leave your position as ceo <laughs> so if you want a child um you know you do that uh and I listened to her, but the problem was, I don't think I burned out necessarily in my new position as strategic director, but I burned out having a kid because I didn't really know how to do, how I have a kid in that setting. And I had to fit into a much more rigid society. Um, and that lack of being able to, <clears throat> to do that was, was very tough. And that's why I had a, I had a massive burnout. Um, <clears throat> so I then eventually left Kahoot. Um, because of that and became strategic advisor but uh, my way back is like the crazy one I started a company while I was completely burned out I built up a company while I was on sick leave but its focus was to get people to fall in love with um, entrepreneurship through the ocean my my place <clears throat> of escape um, and I'm still running it and it's become an impact company um, so you know uh, all this advice about just turning off was the worst that um the psychologist said to me, you can't do that. You need to put your mind into something, but you need to control it. And you need to learn that. So as you're saying, it's many, it's many ways back. And this is what I'm doing now with a lot of founders. Um, I just don't start companies. I also work a lot with the CEOs. I go in, I'm like a ninja shadow warrior. And now it's good for me because I can actually support uh, high growth founders uh, having that CEO experience. Um and I have to say that we also in We Are Human always have had a coach that works with us and we take it into the companies we did. So we take it into um, Kahoot, which we we built. But even with that coach, I burned out. <laughs> so at the end of the day, it comes down to you, even with all your support network. But I was getting more and more open now and you're telling people and you're engaging with people, uh, which I think is a big difference. As a CEO, I was protecting too much. I was taking all the fights myself. I was protecting my employees. They had no idea what was going on until we got sued by the US government. Then you kind of have to um, involve everyone. <laughs> and that was a really good experience because everyone stepped up. The chairman, everyone created a war room, right? Instead of just me protecting it. So um, yeah, it's many ways out of it, but listen to your wife or girlfriend or boyfriend when they tell you it's, it's time to stop. Thanks, Johan. Um, we've had a question come in. Um, oh, I think, Saranga, you're already answering this. Um, but in general, I think it'd be good just to speak about how you, as a founder or as an executive, can actually go about building the support system um, in your job. Particularly for a founder, I guess it can be quite lonely and you often don't have a benchmark for how other people actually deal with things. So um, is it a case of going to events or portfolio days or what are your um, strategies for that panel? Maybe I'll just quickly add to Johan's point that, um... Uh, I mean, I think everything he said is true. I think networks can really help. Um, earlier this year at Balderton, we, we launched a platform called the Founder Wellbeing and Performance Platform, which covers a lot a lot of the topics that we just talked about. Um, and we we focused it primarily on our own founders, but we're hoping to be able to share some of it with, with founders generally uh, next year. But um, one of the key things around support networks is that actually we, we think peer support networks work really, really well. When I was a CEO, one of the few things that really did work um, really well for me was that I happened to be in a group uh, via a third party organization of other founder CEOs. And we would meet um, not that regularly, but for quite a long period of time each time and just talk about everything to do with life and the businesses and so on. And it was never about uh, tactical commercial stuff. It wasn't about, you know, how do you improve your sales or how do you, you know, um, you know, how much do you pay for so and so or whatever? It, it was much, much more about how um, the job and, and life in general worked, you know, sometimes with each other and sometimes against each other. And it was just really, really good to be able to share that um, and see that, you know, the journey I was on was not one that was unique to me. Uh, other people were going through similar things. And I think it's particularly important for CEOs because they they have a sort of uniquely lonely job. Um, and so one of the things we're doing as part of our platform is we've created a thing called the CEO Forums, where if you are a Balderton CEO, um, you can put your hand up and you can you'll be assigned to a group of up to seven or eight, I think it is, CEOs who meet on a regular basis in your particular city um, and, and and just just talk about this stuff. And we're not involved. So it's a very, very sort of um, private conversation that 
investors and employees and you know partners of various sorts do are, are not part of um and the the feedback on that has been amazingly positive so unfortunately that's not open to people who are not in our portfolio today but there are a few other of these sort of founder networks and i would really encourage looking for a peer network like that coaches are great you know stuff you do yourself is great communicating clearly with your team is great but actually just sometimes having someone else who's kind of in the same shoes as you is just invaluable Thanks, Wanga. Another question from the audience. Um, can you provide more insight into your approach to handling setbacks, mistakes or failures in the context of scaling a startup? Specifically, how do you personally cope with these challenges and what strategies do you employ to not only persevere, but also maintain a positive outlook throughout the ups and downs? Johan, go ahead. Yeah, this actually ties up to the answer um, uh, that, uh, to the previous one, and I actually forgot to say well, that uh, to Zerang's point, I uh, yeah, I was lucky to be invited into the CEO forums, and you meet people who are on different sides, and you really look up to, and you're hearing that they have exactly the same problems. If it comes to you know mismanagement of the board or you know uh, personal situations and so on, we also formed our own local ones in London and in in. Um, in Norway, we, and we still keep at it because everyone is going through the you know the same life cycles. And uh, one of the things um, that I also found to be super important doing this was not just doing the CEO. So I part of starting this company that I did one my burnout was actually take uh, I started creating um, a sailing trip from Oslo to Denmark to TechFest, and uh, people had to come on board. They lost mobile phone reception. They thought they were going on a conference. But what they were all doing, they divided into teams that to sail the boat and being there by themselves with a cross section of people from VCs, founders and, and the students, you stand outside and you're together and they start talking and it breaks down the barriers. And it really has become a bit of a success to make sure that you have to get out of your environment and take that time off and you come back much smarter. Uh, and I think it's important to also build this, uh, this, these networks across and just, you know, our company's called We Are Human you know uh finding the level that doesn't matter what position you're in you still we're human and to be honest some people get really bad habits as students and they bring it into work life um student work life uh, balance is not good either so there was something for us to actually try and level it out and and create these networks to go on trips to go to events but make sure you just don't do the panel talks find those other well-being stuff it's super important and when you have a setback which we've had several times people form relationships and then they go back and they tackle it and it's nice to have someone separate from your sector or your business where you can be much more open. I guess I would add, just add to that as well, Johannes. <clears throat> I think we just need to be a little bit more open about what entrepreneurship is like. And we need to be more open about the fact that there are difficulties. There are some serious existential challenges when you're building a business and there are some massive setbacks. We spend so much time talking about the success stories that sometimes when you face one of those situations, you feel like the first person or the only person that is, you know, potentially about to lose their business or struggling with a funding round or whatever problem it is. So this is kind of more for, for everybody that is building a business is it's okay to just admit some of the, the failures and the issues that you've had along the way. Um, in terms of actually dealing with them, I think what makes it difficult is again, the boundary piece because there's so much, like when you're building a business, a huge part of your self-worth and your identity is tied up in the work that you are doing and the business that you are building. and it's very, very difficult when you do have a setback to actually separate the two and to look at it objectively as to, you know, what was it that drove this situation and this setback and this failure versus what did I do wrong and what have I messed up and what do I now need to fix? Um, all very, very good questions to ask yourself, but in the moment, very, very difficult. Um, I think, you know, building a business and being a founder and entrepreneur, like resilience is absolutely key to that. Um, I've had definitely my fair share of setbacks. I would say 2022 was probably one of the most difficult years I've ever had um, in, in business generally. Um, but I have definitely come out the other side of it more resilient. I think when things are really, really difficult, there is always that light of this is going to toughen me up. And I'm sure I'm going to face, if I continue to do this, another challenge in the future. So it's preparation for the next one. Um, but you do have those moments where you're like, I can't do this anymore. I don't know what to do. I'm just really stuck. Um, 
And I think sometimes you just have to give yourself the space to process through those emotions, get them out of your system um, to the point that you can kind of take a little bit of a step back and, and figure out how to move forward. Thanks, Dimple. Um, I just want to kind of turn the conversation to speaking more about the role of investors in supporting founders and executive teams. And so, Anga, as you mentioned, um, Borderton has launched its own um, health and wellness platform. Have I said that incorrectly? Something like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Performance and well-being, but I think it's I think it's well close enough. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, what would you say? is the role of a VC in supporting the well-being of founders? You know, is it an investor's responsibility to do so? And where do you draw the line with that? Yeah, yeah. I think, I think fundamentally, the thing that investors have to do is be honest. Um, and uh, there's sort of good and like, and there's sort of multiple things to that, right? So, and it really sort of echoes what Dimple just said as well, because I think there is a, there is generally a lack of honesty in our industry. Um, and uh, in, in lots of places, in lots of ways. And if there was more honesty, I think actually this would all be a lot simpler. So what do I mean by honesty? Um, you know, we need to be honest about the fact that when, when a venture investor invests in your business, we do it um, assuming that it's a high risk venture. We know that we may lose our money, but that if it works, we want to make a lot of money because that's the business that we are in. And there's nothing sort of right or wrong about that. That's just the nature of venture. There are other investors who would invest in different kinds of businesses. And so we need to be honest about that and say, therefore, if I back you or if we back you and invest in your company, we're expecting you can do everything you can, um, you know, to some reasonable level to make this a huge success. And if you don't want to do that, and if that's not right for you, for whatever reason, that's OK, no judgment, but we probably shouldn't be working together. Um, and, you know, because we're pursuing that, we're going to challenge you and the company to do that, to achieve that, to really go for it. Um, on the flip side, we need to be honest about the fact that you know, that you are human and everyone is human. And therefore, you know, to do this well and to achieve it, you've got to bring balance into your life and you've got to make sure that the other things that, you know, that, that recharge you and that give you the energy and give you the space to pursue your job in this very competitive way are taken care of as well. Whether that's your physical health, your mental health, your family, or, you know, whatever else, or some combination of all of the above. Um, and, and then equally, I think, you know, founders can be honest, back during this journey and so when they need help I think they need to be able to be able to sort of honestly say look last three years have been really hard I've worked really well we've achieved all of this we've had these big setbacks but we got through them but I've got to find a way to find myself some time in the next six months because if I don't I'm just going to hit a wall and and you know if they can be honest about that then investors can be honest back again and sort of say well okay let's find the space for that let's make sure we do that because we want this thing to be a success over a 10-year period not just a three-year period and so i think if there was just a bit more transparency and honesty in those conversations we'd get there right now there's just a lot of um you know machismo on the founder side which is like everything's going to be great you know nothing's going wrong and and then you know they, they they set themselves a bar that they've never hit because of course things will go wrong but equally investors um, you know, will will say stuff to get an investment deal, you know, signed um, without being open about the fact that yeah, there's this is a two way relationship and it's one where there will be tough times, but we're and we're with you for those, but also we're aiming for something really big and a really large outcome. And I think it's when you don't have that kind of honesty that the relationship unravels. Then there's distrust. Then people aren't open with each other. Um, and then that creates huge pressures for everyone, and um, most of all for the founders. I mean, you know, there's no doubt in my mind that they're the ones who pay the biggest price. Um, but actually, it's not particularly pleasant as a VC or an investor either. Um, so, it, you know, yeah, I just, I just wish we could be a bit more open about that kind of thing. But it's, it's hard to do that because in, in the end, when our relationships begin, we're in that kind of sales mode, right, um, with each other, and, and so you tend to sort of paper over some of these. Um, difficult truths uh, because you just want something to happen. Um, but that, that's anyway, that's what we're, we're trying to do more of, at least our firm. I think you yeah. had a question or a point, sorry. Yeah, this is why I liked you. Uh, shame you didn't invest. Um, because there is uh, it's a flip side to this of being open because it's been misused as well, where the founders are open, the founding team is open with their board and it's met with, well, you can't handle it. You're not tough enough. Uh, uh, and there is a lot of VCs, to be honest, which are not good. 
And I don't think they necessarily, you know, they're in the game for the numbers. They're not sure they have understood what it means to operate a company. They're not operators themselves. So now being involved in a lot of funds, invested in about 12 funds and in a lot of companies, a lot why we're there is we're trying to bring this perspective and also show why it's good business. If they don't even understand it from a human level, yeah. you can actually give them the metrics for why it's good. So, we're, for example, we're developing a, an alignment tool for companies, which has to do with a, a greater piece. But one of the first things we had to handle was tensions. And the tension tool is not just for the management, it's for the board as well to understand how tensions eat into founders. And they'll, they'll tend to close down when it's not met, met, met back with true honesty and, and openness. And I know that myself. So um, I, it's really good that you guys are pushing it because really it's the most respected ones that has to push it, has the best returns. Because it doesn't help if you have no return uh, track record or something and you're pushing this. End of the day, people listen to the winners. So I think this is really good that you guys are doing it because I honestly believe return on learning is one of the most important things for, for firms as well. And they can take that to the next one. So you guys are building a machine um, for human well-being as well. Yeah, I'm just wondering, um, how can founders kind of test the waters with their investors to see whether they'd be open to a conversation about mental health or burnout or whatever? I mean, I guess when you're particularly an early stage founder, you don't really want to discriminate too much about who you take money from, right? But I guess you also want to figure out whether this person is going to be understanding of your life, the fact that you have children, you have other priorities, etc. Well, you should, you should care early on. You should speak to all the founders. You know, you should, uh, this desperation for money will just bite you in the back. Talking about everything else, keep taking time. I mean, I know when you come to a point it's very difficult to raise, you have short bandwidth, but this is why raising is const constant unity. This is why you have to be careful. I mean, cap table design is not just diversity of capital, but it's also at least having a few on the cap table who can fight your corner who have that founder experience or they found the network. That's why I like funds who have found the networks as well. So you can actually reach out to the founding network, not just, you know, the partner. Um, so yeah, I think it's, um, it's a balancing act, but it's, uh, you have to, you have to actually pick your investors in the same way as you do with employees and give yourself time and not being desperate. That's never a good thing. Yeah. I, the two things you should do, I think, um, one is reference like crazy. Um, and, you know, the, the the investment fund will give you their references. Talk to them and say thank you, but then go and find your own references. Um, uh, and also, I think, and obviously, if you can find a reference of a founder or a CEO who went through a tough uh, period with, with that particular investment firm. And then the second thing to do is um, we always do a session where we just spend time just getting to know each other a little bit. And we try to do it multiple times if we can, but at least one you know, dinner or lunch or whatever, where we just sort of have two, three hours, slightly open-ended, don't talk about the company. We just talk, just get to know each other because this is, you know, if it works, it's going to be a, it's almost like a marriage, right? It's a seven to 10 year relationship. So um, you need to know each other. And in that conversation, I think smart founders know, you know, how to sort of test the water slightly and get a sense of who this person is and what they're like and how they'll operate. Um, and, you know, if you get, if, you, if it doesn't look, doesn't feel right, don't do it. Um, one thing I wanted to say was that there was another question from from um, uh, Nadia that was in the in the in the chat, and um, I think Vanessa was going to answer it. And I know it's a question I have as well, so I'm sort of desperate to hear what Vanessa's uh, top tips are. We should get to it at some point. Thanks, Saranga. Yeah, let me just pull it up again here. So um, here we go. Do, do, do. On another note, how do you practically get over procrastinating a priority task, which you know is important for your business, but which you are postponing because of fear? So I went straight to my button to say, yeah, I'm happy to take that one because it's one that rings true for me personally and one that I feel, you know, is super important uh, in any sort of, you know, fast paced environment. So um, if I reflect on when I joined Slack, it was very much still in scale up mode and very quickly um, I found myself doing really great work but you know, really not in a position to prioritize. Um, so from a personal perspective, um, I was three months in and really facing down an overwhelm in terms of the workload and really feeling like I wasn't showing up um, and achieving the commitments that I'd signed up for. So it was, a, it was a pivotal moment where I had to really step out and consider that while you could be busy doing great work every day, what is actually the most important work? And what I found was that I hadn't actually done 
a good enough job of really being clear about what my overarching goals were. So then being able to, you know, refer back to those to really consider what is moving the needle, what work is really moving the needle, and then look for the permission and then give it to myself to say, this can't be a priority because, you know, business priorities, they're everywhere. And in a thriving business, in a fast paced business, when you're working with urgency, you know, it's all important. So I think that's the first part, right, is to really step out of it and understand, is this really a priority for my goals and for the role that I'm, 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 I'm subscribed to? The second piece of the question is one that is more interesting as well. It says because of fear, et cetera. So that's one I think is probably a separate question, if you will. So from my experience, if, if somebody is procrastinating over a priority um, out of fear, then that's really where culture plays a role. And the, the ability to put your hand up and say, I need help here. Either I'm out of my depth in terms I don't have the skills or there is another fear, you know, any imposter syndrome, all of those, you know, um, standard responses we have sometimes to, to important work then I think that's where the, the help. And I think this feeds directly into um, to burnout where we don't actually have an ecosystem which allows us to put our hands up. And this is one as a leader, um, you know, as somebody who works in a fast paced environment and that we hear from 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 um, SMBs all the time is super important. So, you know, I can row in with all the reasons why Slack can, you know, offer that sort of open, transparent communication collaboration platform for productivity. But ultimately, this is where leadership comes in. And I think Finding the um, the right way for your employees to put uh, your hand up is directly linked to this really important topic of overwhelm. Vanessa, do you have any other kind of strategies for productivity? So I think you mentioned earlier email, for example. My email inbox right now is gross. I'm going to have to at some point over the Christmas holidays just go through and delete, delete, delete and answer. What is, what is your strategy for kind of keeping on top of emails? Because I think that's something that a lot of people probably in this room struggle with. Well, first of all, I would suggest you maybe look at your Slack usage and maybe we can reconsider. I have another separate conversation about your email usage, but that's for another day. I'm determined not to show up as the seller here. Um, so, yeah, look, I have lots of strategies, right? And there are obviously in product features that can be used to really, um, you know, prioritize like the point I was just making, but also to set boundaries around, you know, when you're doing deep work, when you're doing when you're available to connect, etc. So, you know, there's the um, so obviously Slack, you know, I you have all your information our mantra is to make life simpler more pleasant and more productive and it really is that straightforward so from my perspective it's about on organizing yourself such that you know when you want to have deep work and not being shy of leaving channels for example where perhaps they served a purpose for you when you were involved in a project or you were in a hiring process if you're in recruitment process for example but then you know removing yourselves from those right Managing notifications is the, the simple one, right? So in Slack, um, what you do is you can put yourself to do not disturb, turn off notifications completely or manage the times when you are available, as I said. For emails, look, you know, um, I'm, I'm not going to slag off emails live on a recording, but, you know, it's it's served us really well for, I think, almost 50 years at this stage. But one of the research um, elements that has come out in the last couple of weeks from the body of work that Slack has has hosted it um targeted 10,000 desk based workers is that people are feeling direct impact of burnout from the relentless email chains that they require in order to do their work and be productive so i think you know reviewing email usage comes with a whole more holistic view of how to do your work and think differently it's a good time of year and i think you know a lot of people do take stock and really consider are we set up for success in the most effective way and productive way so, yeah, happy to continue that conversation with you, Miriam. I see Johan is looking to weigh in here. Go on, Johan. Yeah, I, I recommend reading a book by Nir, um, Nayal called Indistractable. I have to disclose, he was one of the first uh, angel investors in uh, Kahoot. Uh, then he wrote a book called Hooked, which is also very good. Um, I learned from him one thing. If you email me, you get an auto reply. Uh, and it gives you some options of how to engage with me or it's saying that you potentially might not get an answer. Um, and then others, I offer them different channels which are better to reach me, which are not email. So it's prioritized on channel. So email for me is I have about 800 answered emails. I have no ambition of answering all of them. But um, if I get referral to some of them or they're signing documents and so on, it's easier. But actually, emails are not urgent. Then you should give people other channels uh, to do that. Um, 
And now I honestly think income incoming information for me, it only has to be through referrals. It has to be on a project basis, has to be, you know, it you know, has to go through other people. You have to be extremely, at least as a CEO, and, and yeah, you just have to delegate the incoming as well. Your inbox, to be honest, needs to be so anyone can read it uh, in your close management team <laughs> if crisis hits. To be, to, it's, uh, that's my opinion. Do any of you use AI tools? Like, is there anything actually useful that you would recommend using? You know, to be honest, sometimes I take an email, I dump it into um, ChatGPT and ask me, is, is there any action sale that's worth having? It, you know, having I have chats open on the items um, because you have to find a way of sifting through it. Um, yeah, we use AI internally at the, at the, at the sort of firm level to, to, um, to sort uh, email. Uh, we, get, we get thousands of inbound emails every month uh, from companies and... Um, we uh, we don't ignore them even even if they aren't warm intros because we sort of worry about warm intros as being potentially my job's obviously very different from Johan's but as an investor you worry that if you just do warm intros you bias yourself towards existing networks and you sort of miss out on you know less connected founders and you know potentially really interesting companies two of our biggest ever um, investment outcomes came from cold emails um so, so what we do is we use AI to categorize emails um, based on region and the nature of the company. And then that way um, it gets divvied up amongst the team so that the most relevant person gets to see it, um, which hopefully means we can process it fast. So we do use a bit of AI, but not, not a huge amount, I would say. Yeah, this, we've also done some research on this topic recently. So, um, you know, I think the, the headline is that the majority of executives feel real urgency about introducing AI. And I think, you know, 2023 has been the year where, you know, it has really exploded in terms of being front and center and top of mind. But I think the reality is that, you know, it's still very much in its infancy and, you know, very few workers are reporting that it's fully embedded in their work. I think next year will be the year where we really will start to see AI show up, you know, in product and, and really become more pervasive in how we, you know, define productivity and, and really look at taking advantage of the data and the context that's available to us within our organization to really supercharge productivity. Cool. I think we have time for one more question from the audience. Um, how do you tackle making a big decision that will have a major impact on the course of your company's future? There's the gut feeling, but also the data and getting subjective, objective feedback from references. It's a struggle knowing the decision can make or break the company. Who would like to take this first? I can take, I'm happy to take this one. Um, something that I have spent quite a lot of time thinking about, I would say, particularly over the last three, four years, um, just because the course of operating, we've had some fairly big decisions um, to make. Some decisions that turned out to be good decisions, other decisions that maybe didn't necessarily play out the way that we would have liked them to have done. Um, the way that I always approach one of these important decisions is, what do I need to do when I am assessing all of the different data points I have available to me, different people that I'm speaking to and the different perspectives that I'm getting, that if this decision does not necessarily give me the outcome that I expect, I look back on it knowing that with the information I had at the time, I would make the same decision again. And I think this is that separation from hindsight, because obviously when you look at something in hindsight that didn't play out, you'll be like, well, why did I make that decision? I should have done something completely different. Um, but you can only operate with the information sets that you have available to yourself at the time. Um, so it's being really critical in terms of what they are. If you don't have all the information that you need, delay the decision until you do get that information. Um, and sometimes that means pushing your team or your investors quite hard um, to make sure that you do have all of the different points of view and, and inputs that you need to make as balanced a decision as possible. I do think there is some value in the gut piece. I, I, a big user of data and you know different perspectives in terms of making a decision. Um, but I think as the gut piece is subconsciously the context that you have absorbed being that manifesting itself in a certain direction. So I don't necessarily think it's a gut instinct based on nothing. I think there is some rationale for it in the back of your mind somewhere. There's some logic behind that gut feeling that you get, um, but you do have to supplement it with everything else. Call out though, 
you make the best decisions in the world with the best of intention. They won't necessarily play out the right way, but it's always important to then look back on your decision-making framework, see where some of the gaps might have been and how you can improve that going forward as well. So just quickly gonna say that it goes back to what we said all along. Some decision feels very big, but can be changed and some can't be changed. And I think it's very important to remind yourself, is this just a tack towards the goal when you're sailing? Or is this literally turning around you know, the other way and it's non-retractable? And uh, when I feel like that, I run what I call a kaleidoscope. So then you find the people who can help you. You go around the table, then I'm just listening. And then I also tell them that, okay, it's up to me to decide this, but I heard all of you. And then it also feels like a collective decision if it was wrong. Uh, and they trust you to make a decision. That's why you're the CEO. So, you know, sometimes you just have to weigh, and I totally agree, intuition is based on data you get on board, and sometimes you just can't know why you came on it, but you know it's based on what's come into your mind from uh, around the table. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to have to close there. Um, thank you to everyone who joined our discussion today. And sorry if we couldn't get to your questions. Um, thank you very much, panelists. And thank you to our partners, Slack, for their support. Wishing you all a wonderful festive break.